Coast. You first service brave people. We have a friend who's uh, visiting from out of town, and their first service actually starts at 8.30. How many of you would like to have an 8.30 service? <laughs> Always a few brave ones. Hope you uh, were able to get some message notes or a connection card on your way in. We're going to keep going through James, kind of starting to get near the end of James, actually. I think we've got this week and next week, and uh, then we're going to start our, our next series on uh, hot topics in September. Really looking forward to that. But as we um, look at James today, I thought I'd start off by telling you a story about a friend of mine named Jan. Jan is from the Netherlands, and uh, he was part of a church that I was planting in Oxnard, and he told us about how he came to faith, and um, it involved miraculous healing. He wasn't a believer, and he was scheduled to go, I think about three weeks from the time, he was scheduled to go on an extreme kind of mountain hike, mountain climbing, something like that, and uh, he broke his foot. Um, in many places, complete fractures, not, you know, just little cracks. And he was so saddened, bummed that he couldn't go on this hike. He was desperate to try to figure out some way to go on this hike. And there was a church that was having a healing service, and he just decided to show up because he thought, well, maybe I can get healed. And he sat, of course, what does any new person do the first time they ever go to a church? They sat in the back, right? Even though he wants to be there, he doesn't want to be there. So he sits in the back, and lo and behold, the speaker calls him up and asks for the story, and he prays for Jan to be healed. And Jan wasn't healed instantly, and he went home, and he wasn't healed and it was about a week later, he woke up one morning, and he had no pain, none. And uh, he went to the doctor, and they took x-rays and could find no evidence of any fractures. That's pretty cool. But people didn't believe him because his story started to get circulated. So he would have strangers show up at his door demanding to see evidence, and he would show them the before and after x-rays of his foot. Before, here's the date. After, here's the date. And it was pretty amazing. And through that process, he came to faith because God's power worked in his life. And this morning's passage, we're going to look at healing. And I think as we kind of do that, we're going to need to start off by defining some terms because our passage is incredibly complex and technical, and to tell you the truth, I really feel like I hardly have a sense of the answers in this passage. There's a lot of stuff here that's hard to understand. Um, and so we're just going to kind of work our way through it, try to explain it, and, and help us all kind of come to see what James is talking about. And so once we define some terms, we're going to look at three different things. We're going to see the role of prayer in the community of faith. Then we're going to look at healing in the community of faith. And then finally, we're going to see how we can get gospel-powered prayers. Because I think we would all like to believe that our prayers have power, right? That they're not just platitudes, but actually gospel-powered. How do we get that? So defining terms, the role of prayer. What, what place does prayer take in a faith community? What are its forms? What does it look like? Maybe some of that explanation Healing in the community. Um, who should be heal healed? When does healing happen? How does it happen? Uh, are there gifts of healing? All this kind of stuff we'll look at. And then how to get gospel power prayers so that healing does happen, potentially, from your prayers. So we're going to be in James 5, 13 through 18. So go ahead and turn there because I'll need you to follow along pretty closely this morning. If you have a Bible, it's great. If you have your device, it's great. Our usher over here can get a Bible in your hands if you want to read from one of the Pew Bibles, and we're going to be in James 5. We're going to look at verses 13 through 18, and we've kind of been saying all along that James is a super practical book. 
he's been kind of explaining how to live the Christian life. What does it look like day to day? And as he starts to wrap up some final thoughts, he kind of returns to a topic that he's hit over and over again, which is this idea of that there's suffering. So he talks about healing the suffering, right? That's one of the things he addresses. Healing, prayer, he's kind of trying to bookend some of this stuff, and that's where we get into this, this, this paragraph. So I'm going to read here, verses 13 through 18, and then I'll pray, and then we'll get right into it. So here we go, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. This is God's word. Let's pray real quick. Father, we come before you now, and we get a chance to dive into your word And I pray that you would expand our minds with supernatural knowledge, insight, and understanding that only comes as your spirit moves on us and as we read your word. So I pray that you'd be with us this morning. Jesus, we know that we can only read your word because of the work that you've done, uh, enabling us supernaturally to really dive in as your spirit works in us. And so we thank you for the work that you've done. And we just pray, again, we need heavenly insight and wisdom, as we do every day. In your name we pray, amen. Okay, so we got to define some terms because there's a lot of stuff going on in here. So first of all, let's talk about the idea of prayer. Uh, What is prayer? At its most basic form, we would say prayer is simply talking to God. When the disciples are in the boat with Jesus, and Jesus is asleep, and the storm starts, and they rush over to Jesus and they say, don't you care? That's a prayer, okay, because they're talking to God. So I really want to kind of just, let's lower the idea that prayer has to be in some special place or in some kind of special format, right, that there are certain words that you have to say or even a certain mindset that you have to have. If you are authentically trying to talk to the Lord, that is prayer, right? Very basic, And uh, I love what uh, John Chrysostom, who's uh, an old, old old-timer of the faith, 3rd or 4th century, this is what he said about prayer. And he was a famous preacher, so he's very, his language and speech was just amazing, and, you know, crowds would love to hear him. This is what he said about prayer. Prayer is a place of refuge for every worry, a foundation for cheerfulness, a source of constant happiness a protection against sadness. The potencies of prayer has subdued the strength of fire and has bridled the rage of lions. He starts talking about the power of prayer, not just what it is. He says, prayer has hushed anarchy to rest, extinguished wars, appeased the elements, expelled demons, burst the chains of death, expanded the gates of heaven, assuaged diseases, repelled frauds, rescued cities from destruction, stopped the sun in its course, arrested the progress of the thunderbolt. Prayer is an all-sufficient panoply, a treasure undiminished, a mine which is never exhausted, a sky unobscured by clouds, a heaven unruffled by the storm. It is the root, the foundation, and the mother of a thousand blessings. You can see why, you know, he was known for his preaching. It's pretty awesome, right? And all those things he mentioned are all instances of prayer in Scripture. What prayer has done? Stop the mouths of lions, right? Halted the sun in its course. So I think what we need to know is that prayer is this incredibly powerful source for us that doesn't require us to do or be anything special other than being authentic and trying to talk to God. But the important part 
is that God does not need you to pray. You need to pray. But God doesn't need you to pray. He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants, anytime he wants, with whoever he wants. And didn't Jesus say that the stones would cry out if the people didn't? God doesn't need us to pray. We need to pray. And prayer transfers the burdens that we carry to the God who can carry them. Because we all have burdens. And pray, what prayer does when we pray is we give our burdens to God. And we're saying, God, I'm not big enough to handle this on my own. God, I, I can't do this. I need you. And prayer, therefore, is inviting, when we talk about healing specifically, the great physician in to do what human physicians can't do. All right, we're saying, God, I need you to work. And prayer either delivers us from our suffering or it delivers us through our suffering. And that's really important to understand. Sometimes you're in the middle of suffering and you pray, and prayer delivers you from it. The suffering stops. Woohoo! That's what everybody wants, right? End of sickness, disease, whatever. Stop that suffering because who here likes to suffer? Yeah, that's what I thought. Nobody likes to suffer, right? So what we always are praying for is an end to the suffering. But the other thing that prayer does when we really understand it is it delivers us through the suffering, meaning there's endurance involved. That means as I keep giving this to God, it strengthens me to last. Because sometimes the suffering doesn't go away, which is part of human life. So we just kind of, I wanted to define this term so we all know where we're going when we start talking about the passage. Now, I think that if we're going to talk about prayer and healing and kind of miraculous healing, because that's what it seems to be suggesting here, we need to ask ourselves a question. Can miracles really happen? The world says no, right? A lot of people say, well, hasn't science proven that there are no miracles? A lot of people out there beyond this, this church will say that there's no such thing as miracles. It's one thing to say um, uh, as a response that science is only equipped to test for natural causes, and it can't speak to any others. It's quite another, though, to insist that science proves that no other causes for whatever we see going on could possibly exist. That's kind of how we begin to answer the question, right? Because people say, well, science proves there are no miracles. Well, some people say you can't reproduce a miracle, so therefore they don't exist, which kind of seems self-defeating. The point of a miracle is that it's special and supernatural in nature. You can't reproduce it. There is no experimental model for testing the following statement. No supernatural cause for any natural phenomenon is possible, right? You can't possibly test that. So the way I would define miracle when we talk about terms is special divine action. So the way I would define healing, as we're going to look in our passage here, is special divine action focused on physical restoration. Now, our world, like I said, is particularly the Western world, really resist the idea of miracles. And this all started with the Enlightenment and a philosopher named David Hume. And he wrote a treatise called On Human Nature and Understanding. And he produced kind of the leading modern bias against miracles. And his essay fell into two parts. And here's what he said. First, he said that he defines miracles as violations of natural law. But then he said natural law is something that can't be violated. Therefore, miracles don't exist. Now, there might be a problem with some of those presuppositions, right? Um, and his idea of natural law comes from Isaac Newton and other early proponents of Newtonian science, but they believed that God established natural law and that God could transcend natural law and act within nature as he pleased. And if you're interested in reading more about this, you probably want to look up an author named Craig Keener. He wrote a book in 2011 and another book just a few years later, dealing with miracles, and his most recent work is called Miracles Today, the Supernatural Work of God in the Modern World. So Hume kind of said that we shouldn't believe in miracles or supernatural healing like this. This is how he kind of postulated it. He says, here's his first premise, all, obs all observed dead people have stayed dead. 
Then he says, second premise, most but not all people tell the truth. He says, these give a certain probability for the following two further propositions. A, Jesus stayed dead. Or B, the disciples spoke truly. And then he would say, well, it's more likely for A to be true than B, so therefore A or B never happened, and, and there is no such thing as miracles. That's his conclusion. And this explanation resonated and still does with many reasonable, logic kind of thinking people in the West and influences much about how the West thinks about the natural world. How does a Christian respond to this? You can't just say, uh-uh, right? Because people don't want to hear that kind of answer. They want a response, something thoughtful. And Christians, we need to be thoughtful in our responses. Here's what a Christian might say. This comes from Roger White, who wrote an article called Miracles and Rational Belief. He says this, The belief that the world was created and is continually controlled by an almighty being not only makes the occurrence of a miracle more probable, it provides one with an entirely different framework in which to consider the case for miracles. When we're dealing with the actions of a personal agent and not blind forces of nature, features like purpose and significance of an event become relevant. And he gives an example. He says this, If I were to hear that a friend had quit the university and has been living in a tree for weeks, I might find the story too hard to believe. The problem is not that she could not do this. It just seems unlikely given her behavior in the past. But when I hear a story that she is protesting the logging of rainforests, the story makes more sense and is far more plausible. The analogy is loose, but in a similar way, God has no difficulty in bringing about any event at all, but an understanding of the purpose that God might have in bringing about a miracle can make such an event far more believable. So we need to be able to rationally answer this objection and, and understanding that if you have an almighty God who created the natural world, it would be no surprise that he could then intervene in the natural world, right? So, continuing to define terms then. Healing. Let's kind of, uh, or, sorry. Uh, yeah, healing. Let's explore this a little bit. Healing in the New Testament, because we get this passage that talks about, you know, praying for healing. Healing in the New Testament is always called gifts of healing by Paul in Corinthian church. Now, there are spiritual gifts that are given, where somebody might have a gift of tongues, or a gift of discernment, or uh a gift of encouragement, right? We see these kind of individual where that gifting rests on that person. But in the New Testament, it's always called gifts of healing. And what we see is that it doesn't seem to be that one particular person has that gift on them all the time. What happens instead is it's God who heals and he works through a human agent. Sometimes a particular person may be able to have that gift more than once. Maybe a few times, but not always. God is always the one who heals and chooses when to heal, who to heal, how to heal. And sometimes individuals might have that gift of healing, and then it could move to somebody else. So I don't want us to think that some particular person has the gift of healing. Understand this. It is God who heals. Always. Never through that one particular person that has that. Healing also, I think we need to understand, is not guaranteed. We have many evidences of people in the New Testament who were prayed for and didn't get better. Paul himself writes about his thorn in the flesh. Now, do you think Paul was sincere in his prayers that God would take it away? Probably. And it never did. Ever. That can get frustrating. <laughs> right? That's where that healing uh, or, or, or ex experiencing success through your prayer, right, enduring through the prayer comes in. So healing is not guaranteed. And then the last term I think we need to understand and explain a little bit, elders. It talks about in our passage, uh, you know, having the elders pray for you. Who are the elders? It's not what my 10-year-old said. They're not a bunch of gray beards, okay? Because when she, we were talking about this passage this week, I was like, so are you going to come listen to the message? She's like, I don't want to hear about a bunch of old gray, gray-haired men. And I was like, that's not who elders are. Well, I mean, they might be, 
right? But who are elders? Elders are the spiritual leaders in your church body. So when James is saying, have the elders come and pray for you, he's saying, who are the spiritual leaders? Who are the people that are leading your community spiritually? They could be young. They could be old. Age is irrelevant. The question is one of spiritual maturity. Have them come and pray for you. All right, so kind of define some terms. Let's look at this idea of prayer in the community of faith. And one of the things I think we'll see right away is that prayer takes many forms in the community of faith. And I think there are four different forms we see here in this passage. Okay, so we'll just unpack these really quick. First of all, there is personal prayer based on your circumstances. The first thing he says, is any of you suffering? Let him pray. Now, what does he mean by suffering? What he means in particular here is that you ref it refers to difficult life circumstances. You're suffering some kind of misfortune. What would misfortune be? Job loss? Death of somebody that you love, perhaps? Not really illness, because we deal with that later on, but it could be a loss of social capital, right? Where maybe because of your faith, and you've been talking about Jesus at work or with your neighbors, and now they don't want to invite you over for pool parties anymore in the summer. Because they know if they invite you over, you might talk about Jesus. That could be a loss where you're socially isolated and ostracized. So James says, are you suffering? You need to pray. And the prayer there, really interesting word, he's not necessarily focused on ending the suffering. It's not a call to pray for an end to your suffering or your misfortune. It is some of that a little bit, but it's more a call to have strength to endure the tribulation that you're undergoing. Yes, you can pray for an end to it, but more importantly, pray for success through it. God, as my neighbors hate on me, help me to love them anyway. So we had some trash blow through our front yard and land up on our neighbor's yard. And as many of you know, I'm doing a remodel right now, and remodels often leave homes in various states of completion. And I'm doing the work. So uh, anyway, some trash blew onto my neighbor's yard. I'm talking about, I don't know, seven or eight pieces of plastic. Maybe one or two of these were from my yard, but most of them were from the wind. Okay? I found other people's mail on my yard that blew into my neighbor's yard. So we came out one day, and he's put up a five-gallon bucket in front of his walkway with a big sign that I think he used about half a roll of duct tape to tape the sign to the stick to the bucket, and he put the seven or eight pieces of trash in the bottom of this thing, and he wrote, my address, blah, 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 trash found at blah, 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 his address. Like he's trying to publicly shame me, right? So we just went and read the note and grabbed the trash and threw it away in our trash can and returned the bucket to him. I think he spent more time making the sign than he did picking up the trash. And I wrote on the back of a little piece of paper, we're just trying to be a good neighbor, right? If, if you just come and knock on my door or let me know, I'd have been happy to pick it up. No, no need to go through all of that, right? Sometimes you're going to be socially ostracized, and I really wanted to kind of hate on him. But instead of maybe praying for an end to that, which I'm certainly doing that because I don't want bad relationships with my neighbor, I also just need, Lord, help me to endure this, this guy because he's just that kind of guy. i got a neighbor behind me that loves the Dodgers, and when he yells out loud and screams at the TV, and I mean screams, this neighbor that wrote me the nice little note about my trash will go around the block to the, his house and leave him a note about yelling too loud. So he's that kind of neighbor. God, help me to endure the situation. Okay? Yes, I want an end to it. Certainly I want an end to it. But more importantly, help me to have a good spirit and to endure it. Right? That's what he's talking about here. If you're suffering, pray. Now, the next kind of prayer that he mentions here, he says... Uh, this, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. That's a form of prayer. What does he mean by cheerful? Is your heart deeply glad, right? This is a call to pray through song when your deep heart is glad, when you are glad of heart regardless of your circumstances. 
you know what? It doesn't matter how crazy my neighbor gets. He's not going to let me get down. I'm going to be glad of heart regardless of whatever he tries to do to me. He can't stop me. And when I'm cheerful like that, I'm going to sing no matter how bad it gets. Right? That's the idea here. There's a deep gladness. And if you have that regardless of your circumstances, life doesn't have to be going well for you. Sing praise. That's the second kind of prayer. Then this third kind of prayer here. Elder-based prayer for illnesses that are causing people to be bedridden. And so uh, it, it's interesting why I say bedridden because he says, if you are sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. So what James is saying is you might be so sick that you're stuck at home. You can't come to the church. The elders have to come to you. If that's your situation, then Call for the elders to come pray over you. Anoint you with oil. Pray over you for your healing. We have to note, though, that the, the elders here are pictured as a group. There's not necessarily a particular individual, but there's the group that are performing this ministry. And it doesn't, um, it's not like there's one person who's the conduit for divine healing. It's the group of elders, those spiritual leaders that um, are praying over a person. This is not what we oftentimes think of as faith healing. Okay, that's not, what's go- that's not what is happening here. In fact, I really have a big problem with faith healing. Because faith healing seems to suggest that if you just have enough faith in your prayer, God has to answer you. And if you don't have enough faith, the prayer won't be answered. And th- Some of you have probably heard of this, right? And so you go for healing, somebody prays over you, and you don't get healed. What's the problem? It's your fault. You did not have enough faith. Let me ask you this. How much faith did Jesus have? Did Jesus have perfect faith? Were Jesus' prayers always answered by the Father? No. No. Father, deliver me from this, right? If there's any other way that I can get out of this, get me out of it. The father goes, no. You have perfect faith, right? You can't have more faith than Jesus, and his prayer was not answered. So it's not about how much faith you have. And I just want to release any of you who have been ever under the burden of that ministry that says, Healing comes from the amount of faith you have. It does not. Healing comes from God alone. And he chooses when and how and who he heals, regardless of how much faith they have. Okay? Now, it's interesting here. It says that they should have this, this prayer of faith, and then it also says they should anoint you with oil. So what's going on here with this elder-based prayer? Okay? So anointing with oil interesting term. Seems to be a medical practice. We know that when Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, that he bound the guy's wounds, anointed them with oil, and then bound his wounds. Anointing with oil seems to be calling for the best medical practice possible at the time. Is one of you sick? Get a good doctor. Get the best medical practice you can and pray. So we talked about this yesterday at the huddle, which, by the way, was awesome. We had some more Bible trivia, and we had teams butter, waffle, and syrup, and the Bible trivia was won by team syrup, and I had to mention them in the sermon as a reward for their victory. So there you go, team, there you go, team syrup, <laughs> and, and it, it, was, it was a blast. It was a lot of fun. We had some really uh, tough, tough questions. You can ask them about that. Um, But anyway, we talked about the doctrine of concurrence. And doctrine of concurrence says that the world works the way God has set it up to work. So, for example, what makes grass grow? Sunshine, water, right? Fertilizer, good. But the scripture also says that God makes the grass grow. So which is it? Sunshine or God? Well, it's both, right? Right? So James here says, if you're sick, have the elders come over you, anoint you with oil, do the best medical practice you can find, and have them pray over you for healing. Do both. 
Not one or the other, do both. Now, James 5.15 makes it very clear, it's the prayer, not the anointing, that leads to the healing of the sick person. Okay? Um, And so, that kind of leads us into this next idea here um, about healing in the community. Because then, James starts talking about confessing your sins to one another and praying for each other. That, That last kind of, fourth kind of prayer is that prayer for each other as well. And that includes confession of sin to one another. So what's going on in the community, right? Healing in the community. How does that work? Well, first of all, we need to see that the elders' prayer may cause physical healing. But I think even more important, because physical healing really in the Greek is only mentioned like one time, even more important is the idea of spiritual healing. Because that's why he ties in this confession of sin. There certainly seems to be a suggestion that sometimes... Illness is caused by sin. That certainly seems to be some of the time going on. But is that all the time? No. Why did Job suffer? Because it was God's pleasure to let Satan torment him. Even though Job's friends kept telling him he needed to repent, he kept saying, I don't have anything to repent for. Right? So sometimes illness is caused by sin, Sometimes it's not. We certainly know that there are physical symptoms that can be brought about by an unhealthy spiritual condition. So sometimes you need to get healing physically, and sometimes you need spiritual healing. And one of those things that can help with spiritual healing is confession of sin. Confession of sin can lead to spiritual healing. You confess your sin, your soul gets clean, and guess what? Your body gets lighter. It's a reason why stress kills people. (laughs) <laughs> and if you can get rid of that, you can get healthier. That's just one kind of small example. So spiritual healing can lead to physical healing. But the other really interesting thing is that physical healing can lead to spiritual healing. Somebody gets healed, like my friend Jan, and guess what that led him to do? Fall on his knees and declare the glory of God and get spiritual healing. And he came clean, confessed his sins, got right before the Lord, and now he has a powerful ministry. So it kind of can, one can feed into the other. Now, if you want to kind of explore more about the idea of confession of sin one to another, I really suggest that you read Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, in his Community Life Together book uh, that he wrote about their time together in the, the Nazi concentration camps. And in one chapter, he writes this. He says, does confession of sin to a fellow believer, is that a divine law? He says, no, it's not a divine law. It's an offer of divine help for the sinner. It's possible that a person may, by God's grace, break through to certainty, new life, the cross, and fellowship without confession of sin. It's possible that a person may never know what it is to doubt your own forgiveness and despair of your own uh, um, confession of sin, and that you may be given everything on your own in your own private confession to God. He says, we speak here for those who cannot make this assertion. Right? Luther, meaning Martin Luther himself, was one of those for whom the Christian life was unthinkable without mutual brotherly confession. So you can read more about that if you want to. I think it's important to understand that there is something that happens in the Christian community when we confess our sins one to another. Now, does that mean that um, on life group, when you're meeting with people in your life group, you should just confess to 16 other people your deepest, darkest, most grievous sin? Thank you, no. Okay? That's to a few trusted individuals that you believe can hold your confidences. Okay? It's not confessing your sin to random strangers. Right? Some of you might be feeling guilty right now, like you need to confess something. I urge you not to stand up and make your confession right now. Okay? That's not what we're talking about. Okay? It's find somebody that you can be real with, open with, honest with, and confess what's going on in your life to them. And when that happens, there is great lightness of your spirit. As you confess to somebody else, it comes off of you, right? Those burdens come off of you. You're giving them up. And it's not like confessing to the other person somehow forgives you, but God, when you confess to other people, you're also confessing to God at the same time, repenting of your sin. And that, that falls off of you. And if you've ever read Pilgrim's Progress, you know what a burden sin can be described as, right? This backpack filled with incredible weight that just crushes you into the ground. I do all this backpack hunting, 
And we always say that the hunt really starts once you kill an animal because now you have to backpack it out, right? A hundred pounds of meat plus your whole pack plus the horns or whatever it is on your back and every step is agony. That's what sin is like. And when you confess your sins one to another, the backpack falls off. So that's what's going on. So you might be asking yourself right now, well, how do I get to be able to pray this way? I want to be healed. Some of you have incredible physical illnesses right now. Some of you have been suffering for a long time, years. And I want you to know that I cannot make any guarantees or any promises. Far be it from me to say, if you just pray this way, you're going to guaranteed be healed. That's not how God works. I don't want you to think that at all. But what I do want you to pray is, yes, pray for an end to the suffering. But also pray, God, deliver me through it. Supernatural, enable me, Lord, to withstand this one more day. Help me to do one more day. And guess what? As you do that, you become a testimony to the greatness of God who can do anything he wants. And he could heal you at any time. So I encourage you. But how do you get the power to pray this way, believing that God can heal, right? That, that prayer of faith that James talks about. And kind of the last part of the passage mentions this. It, it's very interesting here. It says this in verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. For three years it didn't, three years and six months it didn't rain. And he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Some of you might be thinking that Elijah's like this rock star, right? He's like the prophetic rock star. If you have a book of prophets, Elijah's on the cover, right? That's kind of what you think. That's not what James says, is it? James says, Elijah's just like you and me. He's got a nature just like you and me. He had failures, weaknesses, mental faults. Right? But I'll tell you what he was. He was a righteous dude. And James says, the prayers of a righteous person can accomplish much. And if you are seeking God with all your heart, you're submitting yourself to him, you're saying, God, I want what you want for me. I don't want what I want. I want what you want for me. Your prayers are powerful and can accomplish much. And in Elijah's case, they closed and opened the heavens. And in your case, sometimes God might choose to heal through you or do other things. How can you get that kind of power? How can you be that kind of person who's that righteous kind of person? And you have to see that Jesus is the true and perfect Elijah. Right? Jesus had a nature just like ours. He had a human nature. And in Hebrews, the author there says that he's our high priest who's not able, who's not unable to sympathize with our condition, but is able to sympathize in every way because he was tempted in every way. Jesus knows what it's like to walk the earth, but he continually went to the Lord in expectation that his prayers would be heard. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. If you want to have gospel-powered prayer, you need to see that Jesus is the true and perfect Elijah, walking the life that we walk, living the life that actually we should have lived, right? And then dying in our place. And, and we say this all the time. If you see that to the extent that you see that, if you can kind of peel that gospel mystery away, Jesus can, can take over and supernaturally empower your prayer. Maybe you're a believer already and you're like, I want more power in my life, then I would encourage you to see the gospel more clearly. See Jesus for who and what he was and what he did on the cross. Let his beauty wash over you on the cross. Let that move you. And when you do that and you move in faith and you begin to live the righteous life, your prayers will have tremendous power. Maybe you don't know Jesus. I would never think to assume that everybody in a room this size knows Jesus. I would encourage you to see him for the first time ever maybe that he is truly the perfect person. God made flesh, fully God and fully man, living the life that we should have lived. And he lived that life for you. So we've got communion elements set up over here. Maybe this is a time for you just to get right with God and say, God, my prayers feel weak. God, my prayers feel like they lack power. God, I don't really pray with faith or expectation. 
I pray more kind of out of obligation. God, I want my prayers to be powerful. I encourage you to see Jesus for who he is. The gospel power draws us closer. So these communion elements here in the front, back in the back, over here on the side, as you come up today and as you take communion elements, if you know Jesus, I want you to be, Lord, I want my prayer to matter. Lord, I want my prayers to be powerful. How many of you want powerful prayers? How many of you want the confidence that God is hearing your prayers and when he chooses not to answer them, that's his, he's doing that on purpose? How many of you want that? Yeah, I want that, right? We all want that. Come to God in prayer right now as we take communion elements and ask him, repent of your sins, confess your sins, get right and, and ask him, God, I want my prayers to be powerful. I want that confidence. Maybe it's time for you to get right with him here and confess your sin for the very first time. Let's pray. Father, now I'm getting a chance to pray and talk to you. I pray that every person in this room, anybody who's watching, would be praying alongside with me and saying, God, we want powerful prayers. And we know that's only going to happen if our life gets right, if we confess sin to you, and if we believe and really want what you want for us. Help us to do that so that our prayers can matter in this world. Whether you answer them yes or no, we want the confidence that we are praying with faith. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for your sacrifice, your blood shed for us and your body broken. We don't take it lightly now. And we ask that we draw closer to you in this moment. Amen.